Forty. Are you familiar with that one? I don't. Again, I would. Some some of these have lines on the mind. That's not for whatever reason. On the tie vote, do we address that in this bill? Uh, no, that's not changed. I don't think, gentlemen. Okay. Section forty. Section 40 changes the timing of municipal elections. Um, it backs it up from the current primary is done in May with the general election in June. And so what it does is it backs it up to April and it gives more time for a runoff in a primary election before you go into the general election cycle in the municipalities. Let me ask you, how many comms reports have you filed on this, on this bill? Gentlemen? How many comms reports have you filed on 797? Uh, just one. And you did not address the issue of the tie vote in this, in the, in this conference report? Gentlemen, I, it, it may have been addressed to clarify it, but again, um, we didn't change that from what the House passed. I just can't recall at this time uh, what changes were made, if any. But, it, but, but I can tell you that any change would have just been designed to clarify what procedures should be followed. Well, can somebody tell me what that is so I make sure I'm not reading this wrong? About the tie vote. Gentlemen, I, I'm told by my co-conferees, we, we didn't do anything about that provision in the law. In terms of breaking a tie of a general election, is that what your question is? No, primary election. Primary election? It says primary. Uh, bear with me a moment, gentlemen. Primary election. Okay, so the second and third place winners tie, and they both show up on the next one. Okay. That's, in the event of a tie for a primary election, in other words, if there are three candidates and the second and third place tie, they both go on to the ballot for the runoff. And I think current law actually is if there is a tie between two candidates in a primary, they both go to a runoff. Okay, there's no coin flipping in there now. No, there's not because they, they in a primary election where there is a tie vote in the first primary, they both go to the runoff. Now, if there's a tie in the runoff, if they tie it again, for example, that, way, that may be where a coin flip comes in, I can't recall. You all left the coin flip in there for the general election? We left a tiebreaker in there. I can't remember if it's a coin flip or drawing of lots. That didn't change, whatever current law. No, gentlemen. Yeah, you could, well, I'm told that you can flip a coin or you can draw straws. All right, now, can you answer this for me? I'm going to sit down. In this, in 797, did you bring forward the provision of any other uh, bill that had either passed through the Senate or the House that was not in the original 797? No. So any amendments or changes that occur in the current report, we cannot find in any other piece of legislation on either, for either house that was considered uh, during this session? Well, there, there was a separate bill for itemizing credit card expenses, but that was also in this bill that we passed out of the house. So, I mean, I, I can't, I, there may be other bills out there that had similar provisions, but we did not put anything in to the conference report with the bulk of 797 other than the campaign finance reforms that we've been discussing. So everything that we have, again, I'm, I'm almost finished. Everything that's in this bill uh, was either created in conference or was in the original bill. It has no, no old language that was floating around in any other bills that the, that the committee in this house considered or the uh, companion committee uh, over in the Senate considered. Is that, what, is, that, is that true? That's accurate. Jim from Washington, Mr. Bailey. Okay. Uh, Jim from Jackson, do you still have an introduction? Jim from Jackson, recognized for introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, in the North Gallery, a good friend of mine, Mr. Jeffrey Bell, he's especially important to me because he was willing to step in and play a role in helping our hospital find its way out of the financial bind that it, that it found itself in by joining the board of trustees there. Y'all please make him welcome, Jeffrey Bell. Gentleman of Oklahoma, Mr. Payton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Okay, quick question. Am I 
able to hire a family member of a person of this body to work on my campaign as a campaign manager or as a worker? Yes, you can even hire your own family member, but you can only pay them for the services rendered. In other words, they got to show up and work. Okay. Lady from Jones, Ms. Scott. Yeah, I thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman yell? Uh, gentlemen, will you yell, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. In the, uh, over here in uh, section 31, lines 1400 over in there, you know, we had this um, thing about the 30 day voting. I think I'm in the right place. Uh, the 30 day where people have to be registered 30 days before the election and, and in order for their name to be on the poll book. Y'all made, made a change on that. Can you explain that so we can have some clarity as to what that is actually doing? I think it's in the, that's where it is. Yeah. Well, gentlelady, I'll tell you that in section 31, you're, you're, you're correct. Um, oftentimes, the 30-day registration deadline from the election falls on a Saturday, and sometimes that falls on a holiday weekend. And so, an example, not very long ago, maybe even last year, the 30th day was July 4th. So what, what um, this bill does is if the 30th day falls on a holiday or, or a weekend like that, it's acceptable to come in that following Monday and those uh, voter registrations received that day are, are, are permissible. And then the master voter roll that the people will be operating from at the voting precinct. Now it should, be, it should reflect uh, that person's regist registration, is that not correct? That's correct. The only okay. change in, in section 31 is if that 30th day falls on a legal holiday you can come in, registrations on the, on the next day, basically the next business day, are acceptable. Otherwise, those voter registrations will be handled the same way as they are currently. Okay, now, if the person, um, you know, we had these people in that voter contest that we had who had registered, but they had moved, but they were within the county, and then we found them on the voter roll, did we remedy that anywhere in this uh, bill? That particular code section is not changed in this bill. It's left under as, as currently so written. So it's still messed up like well, it was. Okay. I mean, well, you know, kind of messed up for, for what our purposes were. Well, I, I agree that it's messed up as well, gentlelady, but we did not. We tried to avoid any sort of um, controversial type reforms in, the elect, in this bill because, again, this is a technical rewrite that, that updates our whole code. Okay, now the last couple things, back to the campaign finance. I would just like for you all to consider that some of us do have people that we have to help with funerals. And the way this is written, it's going to preclude us from being able to, to, to do that. And um, I know maybe people don't, I know you said we could make a nominal donation. Can you tell me what you think nominal might be accepted? We usually give about $200 to help with these families that are burned out or have to have a funeral or something. Would that, you think that might would be considered nominal? Well, lady, I will tell you the prohibition on funerals really applies to the candidate or office holder's immediate family or family. And so, and again, in, in another part of the, of the campaign finance, there are specific provisions that say that those kind of contributions would be okay. But if you read it, gentlemen, I want you to go back and read it. It says nominal. Uh, no, the first one that you referenced, uh, it says, it talks about burials, cremations, funerals. And then it says, uh, including your family members. And we just want to be sure that when we have, you know, somebody that's um, pauper or, you know, the family needs help, that we can continue to give that $200 to help. And then the same thing on the burn, on when people are burned out. And that's why I wanted to ask you about the charitable uh, contribution. Now, are our churches con considered 
you know, charitable um, organizations? Because, you know, normally you'll see churches and then charitable organizations. And, of course, you know, we donate uh, to our benevolent offerings at our churches so that they can go out and help uh, people that need help. Is that, would that be acceptable still? You know, some of us are not buying garage doors and cars and, uh, you know, and all that other stuff. Some of us are doing, it may not be what is acceptable, but it's certainly not inappropriate. Well, gentlelady, I, I would again refer you to um, section one, section three, C and D. I think those are addressed there. Okay. As permissible expenditures. Okay, so we will be able to, for churches, even though churches is not put on here, we'll still be able to uh, give to churches. Well, actually, it says donations to charitable organizations, not-for-profit organizations, or sponsorships, etc. I think most churches are either not-for-profit organizations or charitable organizations. Okay. I just want to be sure that that's going to be what they're going to say. And if not, I think we need to next year try to fix that if this passes. And then, gentlemen, my, my desk mate was talking to you about the f filing of the papers for it. If you, if you are blessed to be unopposed, did the committee give any consideration to just allowing a person who's unopposed to make that one last report and they will put all of their expend, you know, all of their, if they got any contributions, if they made any kind of expenditures um, and just have one report as opposed to making us have to report at all of those different reports when we're not even running. Well, some of the reports are not required, the 48-hour reports and the pre-election reports. All the other reports are required. Okay, gentlemen, and so, well, let me ask you this. Is the Secretary of State going to put on the form? If you're unopposed, you don't have to make this, you know, contribution. I mean, uh, this report. Because, you know, well, we need, if this passes, and I know the Secretary of State is listening, if you're unopposed, there needs to be something that lets you know what you're supposed to report and what you're not supposed to report if you're unopposed. And it seems to me it would be just very simple to just let the unopposed make one report and report everything that came to you or that you dispersed, but just make one, you know, at the end after all the elections process has taken place. Well and I appreciate the lady's point. That's not in this bill, I but, but I have no doubt that that, they, that that guidance currently exists as far as what candidates are supposed to file and when. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Jim from Simpson, Mr. Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, gentlemen, you? Yes, sir. Gentlemen, I've been reading through the conference report, and I have a few concerns. Uh, would you agree with me that at some point, every member of this body was not an incumbent legislator? Yes. And at that point in time, gentlemen, would you agree with me that in many cases, uh, many of us actually uh, incurred uh, uh, personal expenses. Uh, we put money into these campaigns, and in my case, running against a long-term incumbent who had great access to lobbyists, PAC money, et cetera. Uh, you'd agree that that's the case, wouldn't you? Sure. And uh, gentlemen, as I read this conference report, there's an uh, outright prohibition on paying any non-documented loans of any type. And gentlemen, I'm, uh, I have a concern that if this uh, conference report passes, gentlemen, my wife is going to be upset because uh, she was real concerned that we put uh, several thousand dollars of our own personal funds into our campaign. And uh, I'm concerned, gentlemen, would you agree with me that con uh, that raises a concern about whether there's even the ability to repay those loans? Well, gentlemen, actually, that, that is a perfect response to the questions that we've been discussing about why this isn't effective immediately. Uh, those, these provisions will apply for non-documented loans going forward when this is effective. Effective on, when? On effective. Uh, dis I'm sorry, January 1, 2017. Gentlemen, are you aware I don't have enough campaign funds in my uh, election account to repay the funds that I expended and my family expended personally? Well, well I'm not I aware of I don't expect to have. 
I'm not aware of that, gentlemen. But, but again, gentlemen, I, those are my concerns, and I thank you. I had expressed those before, but apparently those concerns uh, were not heard. Thank you, gentlemen. A uh, gentleman from Jackson, Mr. Reed, for an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the South Gallery today, uh, due to the uh, debate that's ongoing, I would like to uh, introduce Mississippi's Teacher of the Year, Ms. Jody Gorski McKenzie, and her husband Chuck. From the, she teaches at the at the uh, Goche High School English. And, and when she goes to Washington with all the other teachers, bring on the trophy. I'm sure the best there is. And, and with them today is Assistant Superintendent of the Pass School of Goche School, Mr. Boyd West. And I thank you all for being here. Jim from Forrest, Mr. Watts. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for recognizing me again. Uh, gentlemen. Could you, and I hope that you didn't cover this, when was the last time that the campaign finance provisions were amended? Off the top of my head, I don't know, gentlemen. Okay, probably over, maybe over 50 years ago? I don't know, gentlemen. Okay, all right, and what, could you tell me when this conference report was filed. I've asked for a hard copy of it. When was it actually filed? It was filed last night, just before 8 o'clock. Just before 8 o'clock. And could you tell me also, there have been some discussions about this, how many bills are actually incorporated in this one bill? The, well, uh, there, were, there were questions about that, gentlemen, and my understanding is this is House Bill 797, okay. and the only thing that was added that was not in the bill that we passed was, uh, I think, sections one through six. Okay. And when this bill left uh, this body, it left this body as a study, and I understand that we actually debated on whether we should address the merits of the bill or uh, actually do a study. Actually, actually that, that's a different bill, gentlemen. That's a different bill, but I'm just saying the campaign finance provisions left this house as a, as a study. Am I correct? Well, that was a separate bill, gentlemen, and, and there was actually a duplicate of what's in this bill on the credit card itemizations. There was a separate Senate bill that, that required the same thing. That is the bill that we did a strike all and we put in the study committee idea and sent that back to the okay. Senate for conference. Okay, but what I'm saying, gentlemen, could you, the subject matter that left this House of Representatives on campaign finance, it left the House of Representatives as a study. In that separate bill, yes. In that separate bill. And, and we did debate that, whether or not it should be a study or whether or not we should address it this session. I, I can't recall, gentlemen. We did, uh, we did debate it. And my question would be, what happened, what happened to the study? Apparently, it, it died in the other bill? Uh, that's my understanding, gentlemen, because, you know, as you know, the Senate added a series of campaign finance reforms to 797 and then sent it back to us. We invited conference, which is the product that you see here. The okay. other bill, as I understand it, died because it was duplicative of what was in this bill. Okay. And, and my concern, and I've been a member of this body for a long time, and you know, my concern is that we have a very lengthy bill before us at this time. And my concern is and, and is, this, is this a concern of yours that we may be overreacting to uh, what is perceived as being a problem at this time? Because during the many years I've served here, it's really never been a problem. It's it, it just never been a problem. So I'm just saying, do you think we may be overreacting? I do not. You do not. In this current bill, is there any uh, cap on con campaign contribution from individuals? I'm sorry, gentlemen. What was Is that? there a cap or limit on campaign contributions yeah. uh, from any individuals? Okay. Yeah. Is there any pro restriction or prohibition on uh, being reimbursed for campaign c contributions? I, I guess you have talked about being uh, paid alone, but just say if I go out here and 
and incur uh, campaign expense, can I be reimbursed from my campaign fund? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jim from Lounge, Mr. Smith. I have motion, and Mr. Speaker. State your motion. Motion would be because of some of the fatal errors I've read. I move that recommit this bill. Okay. Anyone wish to speak on the motion? Chairman wish to speak on the motion. I would ask you not to recommit. You know, eight pages of this conference report is what we're discussing on the campaign finance. All the other pages, a total of 200, I think 298, you have already voted on 120 to nothing. And we keep getting question after question after question about what's in the bill. You've already seen the bill, you've already passed the bill. With eight pages is all we're talking about on here. And we've made this as liberal as we possibly can. Whatever dollars you have in your funds right now are your dollars. And they will remain your dollars for your personal thought, whatever you want to do with them, all the way up until January 1 of 17. If you have fundraisers every week from now until then and raise another $100,000, that is going to be pre-funds. Only the post-funds will fall under this law. I don't know what else we can do to protect ourselves and to protect you. You're going to have campaign finance laws in some manner. And I'm telling you right now, I've seen all the manners in all the other states. I'm dancing in the street with this. I'm telling you right now. There's nothing in here that's any more than, well, there's nothing in here criminal at all in this act. I would ask you after you're getting ready to take two and a half years of study on your, on your election laws in this state and just throw it down the drain. And that has nothing to do with the campaign part of it. I'm agreeing with the campaign part of it, or I wouldn't have put my name to it. I ask you please to reconsider and be sure to vote for this bill. All right, question now recurs on the motion to recommit. If you favor the motion, indicate you're saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. No roll call is demanded. <clears throat> Okay, bill is recommitted. Announcements for lunch, Madam Clerk, Mr. Clerk. All right, announcements by the members before we break for lunch. I don't see any. Jim from Holmes, you have an announcement? Yes, Mr. Speaker, we'll have a brief meeting of rules in the rules room upon recess. Okay. Jim from Chickasaw. Can I have a request, Mr. Speaker? Yes, sir. Change my vote on yesterday's calendar. Good Item job. number two, House Bill 1729, from no to yes. Any objection? Change the gentleman's vote. Lady from Jones, Ms. Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to change my vote on the appropriations calendar from yesterday. Item 1643. From yay to nay, item. Any objection? Uh, uh, Mr. Change Speaker, I have one, two. Okay, we need to take them one at a time, lady. I'd like to ask unanimous consent uh, of the House to allow me to change my vote on the appropriations calendar on yesterday, item 13, 1650, from yay to nay. Any objection? Change the lady's vote. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask unanimous consent of the House to allow me to change my vote on the appropriations calendar from yesterday on item 14, House Bill 1652, from yay to nay. Any objection? Change the lady's vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask unanimous consent of the House to allow me to, on the appropriations calendar from yesterday on item 15, House Bill 1653, um, I'd like to change my vote from yay to nay. Any objection? And uh, finally, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask on the appropriations calendar on yesterday, if the House would give me unanimous consent on item 23, 
to change my vote on Senate Bill number 2880, the public safety bill, from yay to nay. Any objection? Thank you. Change the ladies' votes. Uh, gentleman from Jackson, Mr. Busby? Nothing. Gentleman from Alcorn, Mr. Bain? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. On today's calendar, request to change a vote of uh, item number two, House Bill 199. I believe I was voted yes. I, I wanted to be voted no. Any objection? Gentleman from Hancock, Mr. Berry. For announcement, yes. uh, House Democratic Caucus is meeting downstairs right now in Ways and Means. Uh, gentleman from Itawamba, Mr. Bell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, a, a, lot, of, a lot of you have been asked to, to get, make a donation to the Tony Green family. I'd just like to thank you for that, and also if anybody else would like to give, just see me before the end of the day. Thank you. Any other announcements? I don't see any. Recognize Jim from Holmes for the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the House stand in recess until 1.30 p.m. You've heard the motion. All in favor say aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. House in recess until 1.30.